PF session and hopefully we get to connect with you all later. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could please have a few moments of your time, I'd like to please acknowledge the Benedict Orama, who is the president of Africzim Bank. Please can we please thank you for joining us this afternoon. Back and you 
to you. Uh, it's me again. Um, uh, Mini has told you that the president uh, and chief of the African Export Import Bank is present with us here this evening. That we've heard over the last couple of days. I think you've heard a lot about um, what the bank has been doing and its work with Canex. But most of all, I think I mentioned to you that he signs the check. So <laughs> to have him here today is a great honor. And I just wanted him to say one word, just to say hello to all of you this evening. President, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to uh, the Kenex event at IATF 2021. We are one family. We started this journey in 2018 when we met the creative industry, an important part of the IATF event that year. We then went on a year after to host, I think last year, sorry, in January in uh, Kigali, a Kenneth's event, then branded CAX event. And many of you were there. And there we announced our $500 million facility for the creative industry. And since then, we've not looked back. We've worked with many of you uh, in many ways, supporting some of you who are in the uh, movie industry, supporting those who are in the music industry, supporting those of you who are in the fashion industry. We, we took some of you to Portugal a few weeks ago, and we were amazed at how well you performed, uh, how you wowed the Portuguese. And now we are here for the first Kenex, Kenex event. That is moving from CAX to Kenex. So we are very, very happy that you are here with us, helping us to get into the movement we want it to be the movement that converts the energy and the creativity of our people into money in the pocket, into development for our people. And I want to assure you uh, that our Frexin Bank is with you. We have members of the Creative Africa Advisory uh, uh, Group uh, who are here with you. I think Ben Bruce is here. I don't know who else is here. Oh, a lot of them are here. So I, I want to thank them. Uh, for we make African creative industry a part of the global story until we move Africa's creative industry into the commercial proposal it should be so that for once we will no longer remain at the lower rungs of the development ladder. We use what we have to improve our lot. So thank you, and um, I look forward to seeing, I think we are going to be having big events for the 19th, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. So I'll be with you all those, throughout that period. Thank you. We would like to, thank you very much, Mr. President. We would also like to recognize the presence of the Managing Director of the Intra-African Trade Initiative, Ms. Kanayo Awani. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of you all, it's these opportunities that did not exist in our industry before for young and emerging creatives to be able to expand, to expand their knowledge, expand their reach. And it's thanks to this incredible team that have put this incredible event together. So again, another round of applause for them.
Gentlemen, I'd like to first and foremost acknowledge the designer that I'm wearing today. For those of you who think my suit is cool, it is by local fashion designer and Durban-born designer, Sandy Mazubugo, under her label, Fabro Sands. And if you guys would like to see some of the stuff that she's doing, she is exhibited just through the back there. Um, some incredible stuff. This is from a brand new collection. So please make sure that you have a look and obviously support local designers. Speaking of which, in the last decade, Africa's collective fashion industry has grown through exposure provided by initiatives such as the Lagos South African, Ugandan, and the Kenyan Fashion Weeks, which attract global attention. This rise has also been fueled by popular culture, the digital economy, and African the digital economy and African cultural renaissance, edging African couture and accessories into global fashion consciousness. Our next panel of experts are absolutely fantastic and experienced in their field of choice. They are experts and they will share their journey to success, unpacking how they were able to secure global reach to support their creative visions. Please welcome the moderator of the session, Gaye Makanu, who is the creative entrepreneur and co-founder of Am Young Fashion. Hi, I am Welcome. Next to La Falaise. No. Introduce yourself, please. Hello. I'm La Falaise Dion, I'm the CEO of La Falaise Dion, the brand. I'm an artist, artist visual and designer. So I started with La Falaise Dion in 2018 after a long research based on African spirituality and practices. In this journey, or in this research, I discovered the power of the Cori shell and the important role of the Cori shell in our ancient society. When I realized that, when I realized that the power that we were holding as an African, I decided to change the narrative because, in the same time, there were these uh, faults and the bad connotation with courageous over the years. So as a proudly African, I decided to change the narrative. So this, since this day, I use courageous, or courageous are using me because I don't know which choose to, which choose who fina finally, but I work with courageous to create a wearable arm, and yes. Wonderful, thank, thank you, you so much. Next, I would like to introduce yeah. Anissa Madeb. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and your brand. Hi, my name is Anissa Medeb. I'm a fashion designer and I'm the founder of uh, Anissa Aida, a ready to wear brand. I, uh, the concept of my brand is a dialogue between my own country, Tunisia and uh, Japan, for which I have a fascination. I'll tell you more about it during the conversation. 
I studied in New York at Parsons Venue School for Design and founded, uh, founded my brand in 2016. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Ms. Santa Anzo. <laughs> Welcome. Santa, please introduce yourself and share your brand. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Santa Anzo. I am a fashion designer and uh, um, chief fashion designer of Arapapa by Santa Anzo, which is the premium Ugandan fashion brand. Uh, currently, I'm pushing and quite enjoying myself doing a uh, youth mentorship mm. uh, with MTN, um, which is really to empower and educate the youth in the area of fashion. I am also the president of the Uganda International Fashion Week and founder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Later, we will be joined by Mr. Kweku Bediako, who is the founder of Chocolate Clothing. But we'll get started. So, ladies, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. My first question, um, it, as a fashion entity, and I, I'd like to start with Santo and then we'll go around. So, as a fashion entity um, that is now on the peak of flourishing on the continent, one of the challenges that many fashion uh, founders find is getting started, rallying moral support, especially from family and friends. Um, please, if you have any words of encouragement or advice for anyone who's starting a fashion brand, what would you encourage them to do? Thank you, Gaima. I think that, you know, everyone should be able, should actually focus on following their passion. If you have found fashion as your passion, your duty to Mother Earth, to the universe, to all of us, mm -hmm. is to actually exploit it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. It is your vision. It is personal. So my advice would be to simply stick to your path and put your best foot forward and give it your very, very best and excel all of us mm -hmm. that are currently, you know, leading the trends. Thank you. Thank you. Anissa. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it's a beautiful message that she just said, and I would also encourage every emerging designer to really define their design aesthetic, find their vision, um, their values, uh, their mission, uh, vision, values, so they can be unique and have recognizable aesthetic designs. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. So what can I say? No. say? You have to know what you want, what you want to accomplish. And when you know that, you have to, you can use the social media because now the social media is very important for the, all the creative to position your work. So when you know what you want to show, when you know, when you find your vision, because the vision is super important when you want to do fashion, you tell your story, you, you can be authentic, I think, for me, the way. Because when I started, I started with no fund, but I started with my dreams. I started with a lot of objective and the thing that I wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And the social pushed me to accomplish this. Wonderful. So one of the things that I think is echoed across the board is passion. Passion is so important. Um, I myself as a founder, one of the things that I've always found challenging as a child of the Africans, uh, my parents are from West Africa and they echoed doctor, lawyer, engineer, oh. right? Um, and I, I studied business marketing, but Beneath that, I always had a passion for fashion. And so I actually held off for some years until my sister was uh, out of school, out of university. And we both decided to go against the grain. And even though we've held different positions in different corporations, we've always held steadfast. And so our parents were not on board initially. But here my parents are texting me, rooting me on today, <laughs> because they see what happens when you pursue your passion. So for anyone who is on the fence about 
chasing that dream, just like La Falaise just alluded to. Chase your dreams, allow your dreams to guide you. I, I think it's also essential to find people who inspired you, like role models. And exactly. Yes. Yeah. Completely agree. And you never know, um, it, it turns out a lot of times you'll start by yourself and then you'll end up being the role model and you'll influence other people when you least expect it. So speaking of which, I'd like to introduce Kweku to the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Anytime. Please introduce yourself and your brand. Well, my name is Kweku Bediako, uh, creative director, founder of Chocolate Clothes Global. Um, we are in our eighth year, well, minus COVID, so seven years. Um, and, um, you know, it's been a journey. We started off as a one-man business. And, you know, I couldn't help but hear what um, my, my, my noble lady here was talking about, um, the culture of being born into an African society. You know, my parents, both of them are professors. My dad is a professor in plant pathology, retired now. Uh, my mom is Tony. And I mean, all my siblings, I'm the last out of five kids, from molecular biologists to stem cells research to, <laughs> to yeah. you know, biochemists. And then there's me, you know. And um, starting was it, the starting process wasn't easy, as usual. They want you to follow their path, and, you know, which is a good thing, but I feel like we're all very, very different. And um, what, I, what, I, what I was taxed to do was to make them know that the background and the foundation was really, really good. And, and I could use that same foundation and apply it in fashion, in Absolutely. lifestyle. And so, you know, we, over the past eight years, it's been building a global business. And we, we can say we're on course. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave you here. I don't know whether you No, I'm with you. Anyone. I'm with you. And that, that brings me to the next question that I wanted everyone to speak to. You alluded to seven years instead of eight due to the pandemic. I would challenge you to actually include the pandemic because I think as a founder, mm -hmm. this COVID-19 has tested us in so many different ways. I think people in general across the world in all of their different niches, but as fashion founders where you more than likely were stopped from being able to en engage with clients, take orders, process orders, supply chains were paused, if not um, diminished. Um, I'd like to start with you, Kweku, and then we go around. If you have been impacted, your brand has been impacted, please share some of those, at least one challenge, and how you were able to overcome it. Well, you know, thanks for the question. And I mean, before I start, I'd like to say a big thank you for uh, this opportunity again, and thank you for everyone to, you know, for coming. Um, so COVID, it's so interesting. Um, we set up our first store in Ghana, 2019 December, just in time for uh, the year of return, mm -hmm. which was, you know, which is an initiative by the government uh, to celebrate 400 years of um, slavery and sort of to change the narrative and bring in the diaspora, et cetera. Right. And um, we leverage on that big time. Um, you can imagine we gaining so much grounds during that, that December. Mm -hmm. um, the following D January, I spent two, three months, three months in the U.S. And the whole idea was we were trying to expand. Sure. We had built so much connections. We were yeah. already in there, you know, clothing the likes of, you know, m most of the uh, interested faces on, you know, Showtime, a lot of politicians. Uh, just, it was just the right as a leader, which you just said. Um, building a business and factoring in such setbacks are integral. And so for me, um, you know, during that whole process, I think three months of not being open, especially in Ghana, mm -hmm. borders, mm -hmm. um, most of my workers, you know, were, I, I gave them the time off. We made provision to pay each and every tailor, each and every worker. Mm. We even went a step further mm -hmm. during December to actually pay our bonuses. Nice. And this was not really us anticipating COVID, right. but we anticipating that, listen, um, you know, there are going to be hitches, challenges here and there. You need to make provision for it. 
again, how do you, how are we also managing our, you know, the economics aspects or the financial aspects of our business? Um, so for me, it was a test of time, and mm-hmm. you know, we we actually um, kept our heads up and we you know made it happen. Number two was um, our website. I mean, there's been so much call for us to establish our website. We tried it several times, but again, you know, you hit some, you know, some hitch somewhere. You're like, oh, don't worry, it'll come, it'll come. Mm-hmm. But for COVID, what actually we did was, you know what? Let's put up the biggest campaign, mm-hmm. advertising, PR campaign, and then use that to launch our website. Got it. And, you know, that was launched last year, and it's been amazing uh, since then. And, you know, third, thirdly, um, as Africans, or most Africans, um, a lot of people prefer to feel we're very physical people. Sure. You know, we want to go Textures. to the spot. We want Absolutely. To, we Layers. want to check the texture of the curry. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. But what we, what we as um, a brand and what I think moving forward we've succeeded in doing is to paint an abstract or a virtual world of how we want um, the industry to look like. And I'm quite excited to say that it's, 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 it's starting to work. Mm. It's starting to work. So costs such as putting in money for physical uh, uh, mortar, uh, 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 physical shops are dwindling. So now we're able to put the monies into other places. Got it. So, you know, I'll just leave it here. But these are the three top things that we, you know, we actually learned from this period. Yeah. Got it. So three things that I want to make sure we recap, and I think it's applicable across the board. Um, the internet... Uh, utilize your resources. If you have a domain, you should be utilizing that domain to open your e-commerce and build on that e-commerce. Advertising, using all of the different social media platforms. The other thing that you mentioned was, I in in the U.S. I usually say if you don't, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So making provisions is very key um, in any business, right? But particularly with fashion when you have a lot of people who you contract. Um, There's seasons that are lulls in general within the fashion industry. So being prepared is extremely important. And and thinking of your people as people, not just workers who are there to do some some sort of one thing. Um, And then the other thing that you mentioned, of course, is keeping your head up. It's going to take that passion to drive you forward because it's very easy to quit, especially in an industry where we provide a luxury service. We provide luxury goods. We don't provide necessities like food and clothing, shelter, if you will, that's required. A T-shirt is required, but fine garments are a choice. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to, um, the next question, I'd like to direct it to Anissa. So Anissa, when it comes to collaborations, have you had the opportunity as a fashion house to collaborate with different brands um, and if so, if you could share that experience, please. Yeah, I haven't collaborated with fashion brands, but I have collaborated with um, choreographers, with uh, TV producers, mm. uh, with uh, movie producers. Different creatives. Di- different creatives with dancers. Uh, and I would love, actually, to collaborate uh, with brands, maybe not in ready-to-wear, but maybe jewelry brands mm. or shoe brands. How do you create? Um, yeah. yeah. How do you believe that the collaborations that you've executed have helped to elevate your brand, especially yeah. with the global awareness? Definitely, it has helped to elevate my brand because usually, for example, when you design uh, for a choreography for dancers, it's usually you don't have uh, creative limitations. You can have a concept and uh, mm. and design through that concept. You you don't have limitations. Mm. Uh, and also for the budget, they usually um, have a bigger budget than you would have for your own collection. And so you don't uh-huh. have financial limitation. You don't have creative limitations. Uh, usually they plan it way in advance. So you have time to really explore your designs. and uh, Nice. So the key here with collaborations, it can actually actually uh, grow beyond your own site because others are contributing. It becomes their dream as well. And so it can go beyond what you may have even imagined. Awesome. 
Um, I do have a question in regards to um, youth empowerment. Santa Anzo, I heard you in the very beginning mention youth empowerment. Can you take us through what that means for your different brands? Not only do you have your personal brand that's been established for, at this point, 20 years, which is amazing. Thank you. Very, very amazing, very inspirational, but also launching Uganda Fashion Week which is a feat in and of itself. How do you incorporate youth into those different initiatives? Uh, now, to answer that, I think I would like to tap into Kwako's question, the sure. impact of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Because of course, youth are the biggest, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, most of Africa is young. Yes. For instance, Uganda is 77% young. Yes. And I think uh, for um, South Africa, it's about 54%. But you see, 83% of our 77 are unemployed. Mm. And, you know, here we are. This is a sector that hasn't even been tapped into. It right. has not been exploited by Africa. Right. In particular. And right. I'm thinking, you know, so, so during COVID, I took, I put time a lot into educating the policy makers mm. in our country and okay. beyond because the youth need an answer, but the youth cannot, the youth is not involved in policy. Thanks. And so I was able to communicate a message that is very, you know, sustainable, progressive, a message that captures the interest and the heart of Africa, which is related to equipping. Mm. And what we did was to showcase the business behind fashion as it really is. Fashion is not just, you know, the glamour, the razzmatazz, the beautiful models. Indeed. Fashion, like any other business, like agriculture and transport, like communication and tourism, you know, like um, uh, um, uh, petroleum and gas is, you know, is... Um, multi-million dollar industry Indeed, you're right. that if Africa paid attention to could actually be an answer, especially to the unemployment. I was able to create um, a platform which was under the Uganda International Fashion Week, which were the conversations that we had with the public government, you know, mm -hmm. parliament mentioned it, because we felt that a sector that is the second biggest employer in sub-Saharan Africa, mm. only second to food, agriculture, that is fashion, of course, and clothing, is, 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 is not attended to. And yet, Africa grows 10% of the world's cotton. Yes. And all our biggest exporters, continentally, contribute only 0.5% to the $3 trillion worth mm. fashion industry. So those conversations, and I mean, you, you brought forth this, and, and you're in an interesting position as a leader, the experience. Do you feel like others could take your and apply it in their countries with their leadership and move forward with the same dialogue? Well, we have done uh, quite a lot with the Department of Arts and Culture here in South Africa. Mm -hmm. They were partners of Uganda International Fashion Week in 2009. We have hosted Senegal, we've hosted uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, mm -hmm. you know, Kenya, Rwanda. Hopefully we'll, ho we'll host Kenya and Tunisia, you know, yeah. expand all over. But our message is the same because after 20 years, we are not looking to just strut on the catwalk. Mm -hmm. We are looking at impact. Sure. We are looking to tell a story that is more, you know, that, that, that delivers economically especially. Africa is literally the world's, you know, uh, beggar. I'm sorry, but this is a fact. And I'm hoping that this information can actually get to the organizers, our promoters of this event, which is AfriX in Bank. What are they doing about the fashion and clothing industry? Indeed. seeing that it's a World Bank report and actually also an African Development Bank report that fashion is the biggest employer, only second to agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about patient financing, you know, to the mm -hmm. fashion players? Mm -hmm. 
you know, to, to the woman in the village that mm -hmm. has a machine. Mm -hmm. How many are those? How many lives can be impacted and changed if that is done? Yeah. Where is the African Union in this? We cannot just be seeking support from the embassies of the EU and USID, who, by the way, have done a lot, quite, you know, a lot for me and the Uganda International Fashion Week. But it is painful to have to get a no at all the embassies, and I believe I've approached all the embassies represented here mm -hmm. wow. and even beyond. In Africa, simply no support. And so I am proud to see that the AU, the African Union, is a partner of CANEX and the Intra-African Trade, you know, for Africa. I was in Addis Ababa where the African Union actually hosted us at the Africa Fashion Reception in Addis Ababa. And so I am hoping that it just doesn't stop at that show. Yes. We want to see substantial mm -hmm. input. And Africa is ready, and the time is now. The youth are ready, yes. and they are going to get chaotic unless a solution is provided. Indeed. And fashion is the solution. Right. Indeed. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. We hope our sponsors are paying close attention. Um, Would totally, you like to add, please? Yeah, I um, totally agree with you because we have uh, the creativity has always been in Africa. We have the creativity, we have the talent, we have the potential. Mm -hmm. Now, for what we don't have the problems is we don't have opportunities for us. We don't have a room, enough of space where we can show our work, where we can show our talent. So we need more spaces. We need more rooms for us. And these opportunities is, is our role, not as a fashion designer, but our government, the institution, to help us, to create this room for us. One day, someone told me, when, you do, when in a room they don't have a seat, for you, you have to build your own room. And in this room, you have to add a seat for your fellow. This is what we have to do now. That is true. That is true. And so many of us, you know, we started against, we would say, the protocol, if you will. In 2017, I had the opportunity to visit eight countries on the continent within an eight-month period. I ended my trip in Sierra Leone, which is where my parents are from, but I had the opportunity to visit several different countries to see and experience what else was happening. Not only did that include Uganda, oh, one of the you. most beautiful <laughs> countries, reminds me a lot of Sierra Leone, but also Tanzania, where we uh, attended Swahili Fashion Week. And it was not something that I was expecting, so it was an, a treat. Um, where my heart, though, was moved before even coming into my country was Ghana. And that was on the, on the, be the beginning of when people were thinking about the concept of returning, if you will. So during that same time period that you speak of, my sister and I, who are um, business partners, we, we decided that we really wanted to see what we could do between both Ghana and Leon to cultivate and create teams that would produce for us, as opposed to tapping into the tailors and the, the seamstress teams that we were used to dealing with in the United States. Although we are typically used to working with African artisans in the U.S., what better would it be to create opportunities for the youth in um, the different countries that we had had an opportunity to connect with? It's one thing to um, create an opportunity for a tailor who already has a business, but to identify youth who just want the opportunity to show that they can do something. They may not have, again, people in their immediate family that are supporting their dreams because their dreams don't align with what is protocol, what uh, the, 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 the different uh, asks are of, if you will, parents, the different necessities. Africa, in, in certain places, it's very difficult. So people want what's guaranteed. And sometimes fashion is not guaranteed. However, to Santa's point, fashion is untapped. The business of fashion is untapped. The, the talent, just like La Falaise shared, is absolutely present, period. There's no question about it. Once given the opportunity, the youth, particularly when it comes to fashion, they embrace it and they take it next level. So this is the time now where we need to be focused on what we're going to actually action on, not just discuss.
What I appreciate is that every founder that's sitting here, whether it's them, they are representing teams. They're representing a group of individuals that not only allow them to lead them, but they also learn from. I know personally I can speak to the fact that my team, a very small but mighty team that's based in Accra, they have challenged us in different ways um, from an artistic perspective. Um, I'm a little bit more traditional. My sister is a little bit more edgy. Our team comes and, and, and booms. You know, maybe it's their Gen X, I don't know. But they give us something that we hadn't even thought of. And so if you have an entire continent, various nations that have that talent and you're untapped, their untapped talent, as government entities, you're actually failing, not only from a, a passionate and, and, and the right thing to do, if you will, but from a business perspective, you are missing out on money. Go get the money. Invest yeah. in your uncultivated talent, particularly in fashion, but in any creative medium. Okay. So we have some time, and I wanted to give you all an opportunity to share one thing that you wish people knew about your brand. So Kwaku, I will start with you. Okay, um, so just before I was meaning to uh, contribute a little bit of what my Ugandan sister was talking about and to share an interesting story um, that happened in Ghana and I think started happening in Uganda, I don't know whether or not it's still uh, happening, which is the Bubu. Uh, oh yeah, Bubu. By yeah. Uganda. Build this, Uganda. This is Bubu. This is Bubu. Uganda, build Uganda. <laughs> Amazing. So, a yeah. couple of years Thank ago, you. our uh, president, Kufu, our, our former president, mm -hmm. started an, an initiative which was pretty much um, a Friday wear okay. know, uh, policy. So, pretty much, you can initially from Monday to Sunday, people could wear anything to work, which was normally suits. Etc. Mm -hmm. Now, when that initiative was uh, came into existence, we immediately started seeing a switch. We started from him. Okay. So every Friday, that pretty much every fantastic. weekend, he started rocking African prints, mm -hmm. stuff made in Ghana, etc. And this was in 2008. Oh wow! Today, you go to a wedding. Apart from the groom, who may be wearing a suit? Nobody. Everyone is in Everybody is wearing yeah. pretty much a made in Ghana. And I wanted to ask you, because yeah. when I was on your site, I saw the boo-boo, yeah. which... Means yeah. the same. So, I mean, you, you realize, you know, you move from east to west, north to south. It's a similar culture, but different names, different um, ways by which they go about it. Absolutely. Even the food. You know, mm -hmm. we eat banku, Kenyans are eating ugali. Yes. You know, couscous yes. is almost like a bak. Yes. One way or the other, you know. So it's pretty much the same culture, pretty much. So I was given that example because I want to, when I went to Uganda and I heard that there was a similar initiative that, that, that had been started, I realized that, you know what, I see this happening if such initiatives uh, deliberately, and the key word here is deliberately, deliberately. Mm -hmm. pushed or started by our policymakers. Well, how about we make a call right now? I, I, my president actually launched Bubu, that's President Museveni yep. in Uganda. But right now, in Durban, South Africa, at the Carnex stage, right. at the Intra Africa Trade yes. Fair, yep. I call upon him to walk the talk, decree it. Let our parliaments yes. embrace it. Yeah. Friday forward to into the weekend, let us all dress African. Let us dress made in Uganda, made in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. That's a way to start. Yes. And I think that... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be yes. African-wise. Instead of Bubu, let's call it Baba, which is buy Africa, build Africa. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> The EU, the Secretary General, whoever it is, the EU, sorry, the AU, yes. should make a declaration and a decree. Oh, really? And, and the, concept, the concept that you all bring up is not something that is even um, foreign, if you will, 
no pun intended, to the Western world. Many of you who may be familiar with casual Fridays, that is something where denim is uh, worn in the workplace and just bring some camaraderie, encourage people to come in and relax and be more um, engaging with one another instead of just head down at your desk. So just that same concept of a different day of the week, the end of the week as you kick off your weekend, which is the best time of the week. Yeah. I think we all can agree, right? Yeah. To do something different. In this case, if that was to be kicked off, not only is it something that celebrates each of our unique um, and some of the differences with amongst the African countries, but moreover, there's a unity in that. Totally. We learn more. Yes. Just like you said, me traveling, it was one of the best things to just see all of the different um, um, uh, commonalities that are shared. We were so intrigued by the fact of how little the East, uh, uh, the Eastern countries um, did not know about certain things on the West Coast. I was accused of being a uh, uh, Buganda, um, belonging to the Buganda tribe when I was there. <laughs> they had never, some of the people I met in the village had never met a West African ever. Wow. Imagine. And vice versa, you know, when we were in West Africa, you know, the, even in education, the history of what's happened historically in maybe Tanzania or in Uganda, et cetera, on the West Coast, they don't necessarily know. So it starts with education, yep. goes into we even in the work environment. Educate right. We Absolutely. Have to educate right. And I must take it on right from there and say that one main thing right now that is lacking in our schools. And by the way, whatever we are speaking, even dress up, I mean, buy Uganda, dress Uganda, or buy Uganda, support Uganda, build Uganda, build Africa, it starts in the mind. Yeah, so absolutely. I always say in my speeches that I'm not in the business of selling dresses. I'm in the business of literally shifting paradigms. Mm. Right. Africa's paradigm must be shifted so that we actually appreciate, buy, and build our own. Yeah. We have a fabric right now that um, we have an advantage, actually, as Africa. Each of us, uh, Ghana has the kente. Yes. Um, I know that uh, Cote d'Ivoire has a beautiful brand. Yeah, the kita. Of, uh, you you know, we have the lepi, one of the fabrics, yes. Tunisia has very good cotton, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And, and Uganda, our, uh, you know, competitive advantage is eco friendly, yes. you know, hand-woven, you know, cotton, which is what I'm wearing right now. Mm. So we have so much lying unused. After COVID, we should be exploiting these opportunities. Mm -hmm. I also believe uh, COVID uh, had a good impact on this. And after, like, during COVID, people started to get an interest for, like, uh, things that were made and produced locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know if it's uh, the same in all the different yes. countries, but for example, in Tunisia, but, uh, there were a lot of people who would go to Europe to get like European designers, and during COVID, they couldn't travel. So they turned back to Tunisian designers, <laughs> and they started a hashtag on uh, social media, especially Instagram, called Consumi Tunsi, which means uh, consume. Tunisia. Tunisian. Mm. And uh, even like the, um, there were groups uh, called Be Tunsi, uh, Be Tunisian. And they really started promoting Tunisian designers, uh, Tunisian production, whether for like uh, food or for design, for art, for everything. And I think not only should it be Tunisian, but we can turn to the, the whole continent. And, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Especially, yeah, so um, last month with Canex, uh, we, we went to Portugal mm -hmm. and we attended the um, Portugal Fashion Week with a group of African designers. And it was great to have that kind of event because I realized there were a lot of designers uh, from everywhere in Africa and I really didn't know many of them at all. I think we should like build more bridges and uh, as she was saying also every country has opportunities yes. has traditions uh, has advantages so as designers we can find all these advantages uh, um, yeah traditions history and 
yeah. create like more bridges and exactly. opportunities. Yeah, I think yeah. as a designer, we should more collaborate uh, together because for me, collaboration is the key. Yes. And we collaborate, me, I collaborate a lot with a designer or photographer in Africa's because this is how we can share our different light. Mm. This is how we can poach each other. Yes. I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. I think one thing too, we, we were able to discuss definitely the challenges, but I do think that it's important to focus and give credit where credit's due. The fact that we were brought here today together, yeah. you know, by Canex, I think is amazing. So let's give a round of applause. <laughs> after yeah. It's a big deal. For me coming, I mean, you guys know my struggle. I've been traveling for two days, came straight from the airport to reach here. So COVID-19, the impact is very real. Get that PCR test ASAP, okay? <laughs> you can get it within 10 minutes, the results, not two days, okay? That's my little plug. PCR locations, right? But the way that the world has changed, that is now something where you literally cannot move in a direction and just get your passport and pack your bag and go. You know, your, your health now, health has become the, f the focus, if you will, um, where you can't literally go next door maybe to a different African country unless you meet the protocols. I would like to, in our last few minutes, ask each of you, um, how, how has COVID challenged you and your level of passion when it comes to this? Level I'll start with you, Kweku. My level of passion? No, I think it's just dependent. I mean, if with such a setback, if we manage to penetrate it, mm -hmm. I mean, everything is possible now for me. Yep. And so, you know, we actually have one of the biggest projects that we are starting next year. I've, I've never been more gingered. You know, I remember you talking about um, how people are now looking within, mm. to now um, um, wanting to wear Africa, yeah. wanting to wear Ghana now. It's, sure. it's just amazing. So. For, for us, I feel like, or for me, it's deepened my passion, yeah. and then it's actually um, highlighted what the vision is, which was to go global from, and starting, going global, but starting from within. So I'm Got ready. It. Let's go. Wait, who is ready? Yeah. Sansa Anzo, what about you? <laughs> well, um, uh, I think that, you know, I'm at a very good place as well. Uh, I love challenges because challenges like COVID-19 literally birthed opportunities. Mm. I did not know how rich my country was in terms of talent, in terms of labor. We have, you know, a very affordable labor. Sure. Willing, you know, to mm -hmm. join hands and work. And so for me, what that has done for me is to set up a world-class, you know, skilling center, sure. literally training world-class tailors. That is the passion and this, that's the key, literally, yeah. The key that, that you say is scale because sorry? the key that you mention is scaling. Scaling. Absolutely. Scaling, scaling and also scaling, you know, volumes. Mm -hmm. We cannot compete globally, at, you know, with Juakali kind of stuff. I think there's a place for Juakali, but after 20 years now, we're looking at world-class, well-done, products that can literally sell anywhere in the world, be it China, be it Shanghai, be it New York, we should be able to sell, you know, very uh, well-tailored garments. And I think that that's a challenge that most of my colleagues across Africa have felt. Sure. The manpower, the skilled manpower has been a bit lacking. But, you know, the opportunity is there, and so we're focusing on that. We have also reimagined the kind of fabric that we'll be moving forward with. Like I said, this is hand-woven. Um, grown, you know, uh, pro uh, processed. Um, when I say processed, I'm talking about the processes of getting it into a finished product yes. and, and keeping it really eco-friendly mm -hmm. and uh, as well very sustainable that, you know, that we are now, you know, we, we, we are rolling out. And so the future is so bright and I can't wait to, you know, to, to literally expand you know, our, our territories in terms of, you know, also employing the youth and uh, selling. In, Fashion indeed. is no business unless it's concluded with a sale. Yeah. La Falaise. 
How do you feel about COVID well, and its ability to inspire you? Well, I think COVID, this side of the COVID, we had the opportunity to be more focused on where we want to, where we were going with our brand, or La Falaise Dion. So this, we, during this COVID period, we took a time where we, we stopped everything because we work with, and everything is made with and is, and crafting. Mm -hmm. So after the COVID, we decided to, to, work, to work more on what is the next for our brand. But now we're working, I'm currently working on the new collection that will be released in the first quarter of uh, next year. Nice. And also with different uh, exhibition and uh, artistic performance with galleries and uh, museum. Because for mm. me, it's important. The artistic part is very important for me. The experience to share the stories that I am telling with my work through my work and the cowrie shell. Indeed. The cowrie shell goddess, <laughs> La Falaise. <laughs> Anissa. For me, to be honest, at the very beginning of COVID, I had to face a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest about this. The production at the factories, uh, it stopped for months. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also all the stories that were selling my brand, they were closed for months, <laughs> which was also really difficult. Sure. I had my e-commerce website, but um, people on lockdown didn't really feel like buying <laughs> something. <laughs> but, uh, but then during the, these months of COVID, there were many opportunities that presented themselves. Uh, first, as you said, I really worked on the improving my website, make it more appealing, launching campaigns, and this really helped because after, after a few months of uh, wearing your pajama pants and uh, <laughs> people wanted to like wear something cool again, so yeah. they went and yeah, I had more sales on my website. As you were saying too, uh, the COVID situation really forced me to think more sustainably in the production and work more with artisans and uh, local and... Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. it was really tough at the beginning, but then it was a good thing and it was a challenge, but uh, in a good way. Fantastic. Awesome. For me, um, as a lead, I, our, our brand has done a lot of pivoting. One thing that we had wanted to do for years and never really stepped into that space was athleisure. And so the COVID um, pause is what I call it, not quitting, but the COVID pause allowed the opportunity to truly pivot. And so I think across the board, the creativity surged. It continues to surge and now it's time to take action if you have not done so already. So just want to thank you all for listening to the discussions and thank we'll you. be back. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. I don't know what to do next. <laughs> <laughs> Photos. Okay.